So today I'd like to talk to you all about implementing low power AI SOCs using Network on Chip Interconnect technology. Now, before we dive into some of the power saving aspects of Network on Chip technology, it is important to understand where and how the NOC Interconnect fits into the SOC. So here I have a block level diagram of an SOC and we can see that there are many different subsystems within the SOC. So there's multiple CPU subsystems, a safety critical subsystem, machine learning subsystems, and various others. And what we can see here is that the interconnect IP facilitates the communication between all the different subsystems in the chip. When it comes to cache coherent communication, this would be handled by a cache coherent interconnect such as n -core. And when it comes to non-current interconnect, communication, it's going to utilize FlexNUC. Since the interconnect though is responsible for handling all the communication on the SOC, it actually implements the underlying SOC architecture. And to illustrate that, we can take a look at a mobile application processor chip. So here on the right, I have a view of a floor plan of such a chip. What we can see is that all these CPUs or all the IP subsystems, such as the CPU, GPU, DNA, they take the form of hard IPs in the floor plan that are placed by the physical design team. And it is the role of the network on chip interconnect to connect up all of these different hard IPs on the chip by filling in the area or the white space between them. How do they do this? Well, a network on chip is comprised of different units. These units are protocol converters and packetizers, which we often refer to as network interface units. These units also include switches and adapters. Together, these different units form a set of routes that connect up the different hard IPs through different sets of wires. And they do so by balancing different requirements that the SOC has. These can be performance requirements in terms of latency and throughput requirements for different subsystems. They can be physical domain requirements, namely blockages in the floor plan, different routing channels, different timing constraints. And they can also be power requirements, both active and leakage. In order to optimize and balance between these different requirements, a NOC creation tool allows for the parameterization of the NOC IP so that the network on chip interconnect can be configured and tuned precisely to the requirements of the SOC. And as the title of this presentation suggests, the power requirement aspect is becoming more and more important in today's SOCs especially those in the AI space. And so that sort of brings up the question, how exactly do network on chip interconnects help optimize for power? Well, network on chips are architected to save power from the ground up. They use a technology called packetization, which results in fewer wires to do the communication across the chip. If I have fewer wires on the chip, this results in less data path logic, which results in fewer gates. A very common example of a data path logic element that you need to utilize in a network on chip interconnect is a pipeline stage, right? If I need to span distance in my chip, I need to instantiate these pipeline stages to cover the distance. If I'm not using a packetized network on chip, I may need 300 wires to do the communication, which means every time I insert this pipeline stage, I insert 300 D flip-flops in the design. If I can leverage packetization, though this number goes down significantly, I can do the same communication in 180 wires. So you can see this brings the number down of logic elements down significantly, resulting in less power, both from an active standpoint and a leakage standpoint. Further along the lines of packetization is the notion of a transport protocol. So the NOC elements that are within the routes, namely the switches that are 
doing MUX and DMUX functions and adaptation elements don't need to be aware of all of the contents of a packet. So they are using a very simple protocol to facilitate the routing of a packet, which makes them very lightweight in terms of logic complexity and very suitable for clock gating techniques, which are very important for reducing power consumption in an SOC. A NOC architecture also allows breaking a communication path into small segments and allows the system to power only the segments needed in that mode of operation while power gating the rest of the chip. This, along with low frequency operation techniques, can be used to drastically bring down the power in the system. So let's dive a little deeper into these power saving aspects, focusing especially on the clock gating component. A network on chip interconnect supports three levels of clock gating. This is local gating, unit level gating, and root clock gating. These are all enabled by different sources, but they come together within the NOC IP to provide critical SOC level power control. So let's take a look at these three clock gating strategies. The first is local clock gating. This is clock gating that is inferred by a synthesis tool such as Synopsys Power Compiler or Cadence Genus Synthesis Solution. What the synthesis tool is doing is it's looking within the NOC RTL and looking at the DFFs or D flip flops specifically. Whenever it identifies a group of D flip flops that share an identical enable signal, it will insert a clock gating element for that group of DFFs. In a typical NOC configuration, this local clock gating will cover about 95% of the D flip flops in a NOC using a few thousand clock gating elements. So it realizes a very fine grained clock gating approach to cover most of the NOC registers and reduce the power consumption of the NOC. Now, one level above this local clock gating is unit level clock gating. So we talked about how a NOC is comprised of different IP units. These are the network interface units that are packetizing the requests. These are the switches that are muxing and demuxing traffic and adapters for say with adaptation or clock adaptation. Now unit level clock gating works by assigning a clock gator to each of these units and a unit gator IP that we see that is built into the NOC is monitoring the activity within the NOC. And whenever an IP unit, such as a network interface unit, is not processing a packet, the unit gator will gate the clock of that NIU. Whenever it does need to process a packet, it is ungated. And this is all done on the fly with no throughput or latency degradation. So it's a very powerful technique. This technique becomes even more important in the context of AI SOCs that have functional safety requirements, such as those that are targeted for automobiles and autonomous driving applications. To reach the high levels of fault coverage defined by ASIL-D, you often have to employ a hardware technique called unit duplication, namely duplicating, say, a network interface unit on the NOC. Now, with unit clock gating, even though I have this additional logic, the unit gator will still intelligently gate the clock of the duplicated unit to help keep power consumption low, even when there is functional safety functions present within the interconnect. Now, at the highest level of clock gating is root clock gating. Today's SOCs are often split into multiple independent power domains that are controlled by an SOC power management unit. Now, the SOC may comprise of multiple NOC instances that exist in a single power domain or multiple domains. And often is the case, as is shown in this picture, a single NOC instance can span multiple power domains. So here a NOC is part of the on domain, but it's also part of two or three other supply domains. Whenever the PMU wants to shut down a particular domain, it will shut down all of the NOC elements in that domain. In fact, 
the SOC PMU can leverage the capability of partitioning the NOC within multiple power domains, both inside and outside of the NOC. The NOC has a set of hardware units within it that allow for clean state transitions in the presence of power gating and clock gating at the root level. To facilitate the communication, a NOC power controller is instantiated for each power domain in the system and will communicate with the SOC power management unit, a simple handshake protocol. The PMU can just use that protocol to signal when the domain it wants to shut down should go into an idle state and the power controller will take a series of steps to ensure that an idle state is reached before power down. Additionally, these components can facilitate waking up a power domain on demand by notifying the SOC PMU if there is activity or a packet that is going towards a domain that is currently shut down. And that is the role of this disconnect unit you see here. If one of the agents is trying to send a packet to target two in my diagram and domain one, which target two exists and is powered off, the packet will be held at this disconnect unit and the disconnect unit itself will notify the PMU to wake up the domain because there's transactions pending for target two. This demand handling support also enables dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, which is a very sophisticated technique used to increase the performance of a system by raising the voltage and frequency during modes of operation where more compute is needed but also lowering the voltage and frequency in modes of operation where less compute is needed to maximize power savings within the system. Now, these same domain handling techniques actually play a significant role in the context of functional safety in the system. Now, a functional safe SOC tends to have a safe knock that is employing the resilient mechanisms such as unit duplication that we spoke about earlier. And in certain modes of operation, it may become necessary to isolate an IP from the safe NOC to cut off communication. In which case, these power domain mechanisms can be utilized to do that. The PMU can signal to the NOC's power controller that it needs to cut this communication and a socket power disconnect unit will ensure no transactions can come into the safe knock. He is fenced off the NPU from sending transactions into the knock. So how do these all, all these features come together and what benefits do they have when we're talking about different levels of AI SOCs? Well, our customers have used our network on chip technology in a wide range of SOCs. These can be very large AI SOCs in the data center that have say on the order of hundreds of masters and slaves. They can be very low power IoT edge processing SOCs that only have say a dozen or so masters and slaves or something in between that. What we can see here is that across the board, the area is significantly reduced by leveraging the packetization and customization features of the NOC and the clock gating features on top of those area savings drastically reduce the power of the NOC. All of this is still in the presence of very high levels of performance, which is especially critical for today's AI SOCs. One such SOC is the Toshiba ADAS SOC. This is a production chip that is doing AI functions it has very high performance requirements for computing many different image recognition applications. Since this is an ADAS SOC, it is also targeted at being in an automobile. So it has functional safety requirements on top of those high performance requirements. And it must maintain a very low power budget within the car. So it actually, it's a very prime example of a SOC that's trying to optimize across performance, power, and area. And Toshiba actually 
achieves very impressive results with their heterogeneous architecture. They can achieve over 20 tera operations per second, and they do so very efficiently, two tops per watt. So these are very impressive numbers. Looking at a little bit of the internals of the Toshiba ADAS SOC's structure, we can see that they are using NCore as their cache coherent interconnect, and they are using FlexNuff with the resilience package for their non-coherent interconnect. Their system is partitioned into two different domains. This is a safety island, which has ASLD d requirements and is more for control processing within the system. And then there is a processing island, which has ASL c requirements and is doing a lot of the image recognition computation. Now, across this processing island and safety island, there are eight different FlexNuck instances, and all of them are using resilience with that unit duplication feature we were mentioning earlier. So even though there is unit duplication to ensure the high levels of fault coverage are reached for ASLC and ASLD, Toshiba is able to maintain very low power consumption by utilizing these different clock gating techniques and network on chip technology in their ADAS SOC. So to recap, a lot of these edge AI and machine learning SOCs, they have very high performance requirements. Uh, they have to do a lot of computations that are very data intensive, but they also have very stringent power budgets, right? These are going into cars or other edge processors where there's not a infinite supply of energy. So NOC technology can actually help play a role in managing the SOC level power consumption by utilizing those three levels of clock gating we discussed. And many very complex edge AI SOCs, especially those within the automated driving segment, rely on network chip on chip technology to reduce their power consumption, especially in the context of high levels of functional safety. For SOCs targeting ASL D, these often require unit duplication. And if this unit duplication is not architected properly with respect to these clock gating techniques, this can greatly increase the power consumption of the overall system. FlexNuck network on chip technology, though, fully utilizes this unit level clock gating technology to keep the power consumption very low, even when these functional safety mechanisms are present in an SOC that requires a very large amount of compute. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for that presentation. That was pretty good. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible during this 10 minute period. Okay. Um, I guess I can uh, start things off by asking a question. Um, now you're talking about your clock gating. Uh, when a knock shuts down, how fast can it wake up? Is it fast enough for a real time processor? Is there a programmable time interval to keep it from shutting down too often? So this would be architected at the system level, but I would say the wake up on demand feature does enable waking up within a very short period of time. This handshake protocol between a Knox domain and say the system management or power management unit is very lightweight and it comprises of just three signals. So once a PMU notifies a particular domain within the Knox to wake up, this happens very fast. Fast enough for a real time system to respond. I'm thinking of, uh, well, you probably wouldn't put it to sleep in a car uh, but, you know, <laughs> something, something, some critical operation has to happen, and that part of the ship, ship is shut down. You want yes. it to wake up for a real-time response. Yes. Uh, in terms of the knock portion of that wake-up, it happens on the order of a couple cycles, usually. Okay. And then I'd say at the system level, you could program it so that you don't want it to go to sleep, you know, say, uh, unless it's inactive for a certain amount of time. Yes. Actually, this is something we interact with our customers about, right? There are different timeout mechanisms in the NOC and different activity indicators that they can basically tap into to get that information at the system level to understand whether it's appropriate to move to a lower power state or, or not, right? So those activity indicators are there that our customers utilize to make those types of decisions. Okay. Um, 
we have a question here from a uh, attendee. Does the NOC support multicast groups? So I think this is alluding to uh, a multicast transaction or a write broadcast transaction, which is a very common uh, operation needed, especially in AI and machine learning. I want to send, say, a piece of write data out to all or a subset of the targets in my system. And yes, this is something that network on chip technology supports. We have what we call a write broadcast station built into the NOC that can do such an operation. Okay, uh, we have another question here. Um, what is the maximum throughput? So this is a question that we get a lot, uh, but the, since the NOC is a configurable IP, the maximum throughput entirely depends on the configuration, right? But the NOC is capable of running at very wide uh, data path sizes and very high frequencies. So, uh, it's only, say, limited by the imagination of the configuration, right? But once you do have that configuration in place in the NOC, these numbers uh, can be generated through the NOX configuration tools to sort of describe that to the customer. Yeah, maybe he's talking about the maximum number of like wires or something you can have on a, on a data path. Yeah, so in, in terms of that number, right, the, the AI package of FlexNOC, which is targeted for these AI SOCs, supports up to 1024-bit wide data paths. And you may instantiate many of these 1024-bit wide data paths. So you could have many going in parallel if you need to realize more throughput in the system. I see. So the real limitation is going to be basically how much wiring you can fit into your silicon. Yeah, that's generally the main constraint, right, is how much area do you have on your floor plan? Because at the end of the day, uh, that's going to determine how many wires you can route through the channel. Right. And the NOC is actually very well adept at configuring the amount of wires to use at each point in the network. So you have very fine control over how many wires you're using at each point in the network. Okay. Another question from an attendee um, is NOC technology used within AI subsystems too, or just at the SOC level? Uh, I would say it is used in AI, SS, or AI subsystems as well. So the NOC can function both at the top level and within the subsystem. And you can realize a hierarchical NOC approach if, if you want to in your system. Our technology fully supports that. But I do have customers today using the technology for a machine learning or AI subsystem. OK. We have another question here. You showed a chiplet interface on one of the slides. Can you elaborate on that interface, please? Yeah, so many customers, especially those in the AI space, uh, have taken a chiplet approach to basically solve their compute needs. At one end of the spectrum, you have customers that basically just want to create a one very large chip, but there are different challenges that come into play if you have a very large chip. So a different strategy would be to break up the compute into a series of chiplets that connect together. And the NOC, from a NOC perspective, right, we already have a way of defining what we call a multi-NOC system. So the connection between these different chiplets, it doesn't matter so much for us. We're able to understand though that there's a NOC on the other side of that chip-to-chip -chip connection. OK. Another question from an attendee. Uh, we saw a few mesh topologies in the presentations on data center chips earlier today. Yep. Can the NOC be used in a mesh topology? If not, what topologies does it support? Good question. So the NOC technology that Arteris offers is capable of realizing any topology. It's a, the network components can be constructed to realize any topology, including those of meshes, rings, toruses or something more custom, right? So in my presentation, the say mobile application processor had a very custom uh, topology. It supports those, but it also supports those meshes and toruses that are, tend to be used in the AI application space. Okay, um, another question. Could you highlight some key differences uh, with ARMS knock? 
So I think the core technology, right, of network on chip is packetization, right? That's something we talked a little bit about during my presentation. And that packetization really realizes a lot of power when it comes to the configurability of, say, how the switch topology looks. One other aspect that sort of differentiates a network on chip, such as the Arteris NOC, would be the fact that it can support and translate seamlessly between different protocols. So AMBA is a very popular protocol. Of course, AXI is the dominant one. You may have agents in the SOC that are also using, say, AHB or APB. These NIUs can seamlessly translate between the different protocols used between the different agents in your system without additional logic. So that's maybe a protocol decoupling aspect is what we would call that. OK. Um, question, what is the latency through a NOC switch? Good question. So actually, the switches themselves are fully combinatorial. Uh, you do not need any pipeline stages within them. So there's no latency hit to go through them. Um, generally, the latency comes from spanning distance on the floor plan, right? As if I need to go, say, several millimeters between two different agents in my system, I need to add pipeline stages to cross the distance. But the latency of the NOC units themselves can be zero, right? There's no mandatory pipeline stages. OK. Another question from an attendee. Can the topologies be changed on the fly, or is the topology fixed by chip design? Uh, well, the topology is going to implement a set of hardware, right, that is going to exist there, right? So, uh, so that sort of, say, set of switches and routes is fixed because that's what you've defined in hardware. But there are configurability aspects of the NOC, right? You can tune things such as the QoS mechanisms at runtime. So while that structure is there, you know, you have control over how the network on chip is operating in terms of the programmability of different elements like QoS or security mechanisms. OK. We're out of time, and we're also out of questions. So it worked out perfectly. Thank so you, thank Tom. You. Thank you, Matthew. Good job. Thank you.